Hey everybody, welcome to episode 74 of the Masterclass. My name is Cam, and I am joined, uh, big surprise, by this guy named Dave. I am here, yes. Indeed, I, like, as always, I, I'm, I'm glad that you're here. Thank you. Otherwise, it'd be weird that I would be alone in your in your basement. I know I've made that joke before, but I don't care. I'm going to do it again. <laughs> yes, it would be creepy. Sitting alone down here with the cats. Olivia has started watching Stranger Things on mm-hmm. Netflix, which I haven't mi- watched it yet. Mildly entertaining. I'll, I'll acknowledge that. But... Uh, Melissa and I are going to be out of town this weekend. Asked Olivia if she wanted to stay home by herself on Friday night. And she basically said, no, I've been watching Stranger Things all week and it freaks me out. (laughs) So I don't want to be left alone. (laughs) Fair enough. Yes. Well, we're back. It's been a whole week. Things have happened. Yes. One thing that didn't happen. No one submitted their version of Rabbi T for us. It's oh, okay. No. I'm, I'm only mildly heartbroken. <laughs> so, for those of you who don't know who Rabbi T is, means you did not listen to the very end of last week's episode. If you're curious, you can go listen to the end of episode 73. Because, frankly, I don't think I could do it justice this week. <laughs> it's been too long. That ship has sailed, as they say. Yes, yes it has. But hey, it's a new week. It's a new day. And we have a new passage. Well, not really new. It's been it's been around a while. You know, like 2000 years or so. Mm. But it's new to this podcast. How do you like that for a segue, Dave? Sounds good. So, we're at Matthew 21, 28 through 32. And it reads, What do you think? A man had two sons. And he went to the first and said, Son, go and work in the vineyard today. And he answered, I will not. But afterwards, after word, he changed his mind and went. And he went to the other son and said the same. And he answered, I thought this was weird when I was reading this. I go, sir. I go, sir. But did not go. Which of the two did the will of his father? They said, the first, Jesus said to them, truly, I say to you, the tax collectors and the prostitutes go into the kingdom of God before you. For John came to you in the way of righteousness and you did not believe him, but the tax collectors and the prostitutes believed him. And even when you saw it, you did not afterward change your minds and believe him. Sick burn. Yes, very much. All right. So Jesus, uh, as he is, um, well, as he is wont to do quite often, um, proposes a story or a parable for the listeners at hand um, that he will then, uh, usually he doesn't really explain it, you know, for those who have ears, let them hear, that sort of thing. Mm-hmm. Um, but in this case, he immediately tells, or he immediately makes the parallel so that there's no misunderstanding, right. which I think is interesting that this is one of the few where he says, here's exactly what I mean. He doesn't leave it up for interpretation. He doesn't, you know, just walk away and leave the people puzzled or what have you. As soon as they answer the question, he tells them exactly what he means by it. And I just, Mm -hmm. I find that interesting that of all the parables, this is one of the few that he chooses to do that with. I think he was feeling bad about our discussion last week when... They asked him a question, and then he asked them a question, and they didn't know the answer, so he said, neither will I tell you the answer, and so I think he felt like he owed him one. It was a make-up call. A make-up call. Uh, oh, boy. <laughs> Jesus. That, but that wouldn't mean that he was wrong? No. Or just that he Yeah, had... I guess if it was technically a make-up call, then that means he made the wrong call, which, no, it was not a make-up call then. Could you imagine if Jesus was a referee, never getting a call wrong? That'd actually be kind of nice. Hmm. I think that raises a whole bunch of questions on that right there. Yeah, because is getting a call in a game a sin? Right. 
Because I would assume you could be wrong. And not sin. And not sin. But could you still be perfect? Could you be God? And get something wrong? Like, hmm. Like, would he have to run the table on Jeopardy just because? (laughs) I mean, besides the fact that he could, because he knows all things. But, like, does that mean that by, by his nature he can't be wrong? Because like I can, see, get, I can get a math problem wrong and not sin, it right. just means I didn't add correctly. Well, and I even think being a referee adds in a whole other element of, I believe there are calls that are wrong just because they, they couldn't see it. They couldn't, you know, we have these slow motion replays that over, you know, totally overanalyze what just yeah. happened. And yet they have to make that split second. Yeah, and we get all bent out of shape because the super, super... HD slow mo shows one blade of grass between the guy's foot and the out of bounds marker, and the referee who's eight yards away blows right. the call. Yeah. So, I, mm. I I just will say I hate instant replay in any sport. I hate it. What I well what I strongly dislike, is when I go to a sports game, and the people sitting around me think that they have a better vantage point than the official who's on the field. And every call the official makes that goes against the home team is clearly wrong because the ref is an idiot and is blind. And and they from 30 rows or more back can see better what is or is not uh, a penalty or a strike. Like when you're in the upper deck at a baseball game and the people behind you are saying, oh my gosh, that ball was a strike. You are 300 (laughs) feet away from home plate. There is no way you have a better vantage point or ability to call balls and strikes. Or when we were at a soccer game a few weeks, it's just like, oh, I just, it's, it, it makes me not like people. Yeah. And it makes me think bad things about them. And I know that's, you know, my own. It's not their fault that I want to (laughs) say very mean things to them. But it's just the worst. So, yeah, that was a tangent. It was a tangent. Sports. Hey, listeners, if you like sports, (laughs) we have... Shameless plug. Yeah. Three three options for you on Super Megacorp. We've got a uh, baseball podcast that me and my friend Nick do called the Mendoza Line. It's weekly. We just put out our last episode yesterday. It's entitled Tim Tebow is the next Bo Jackson. Hmm, discuss. We also have a pro wrestling blog that I write. And we also have a college football blog that uh, our friend Martin writes. Go to supermegacorp.net to find out more. <laughs> I tried to throw my radio voice on. Did it sound good? Mm, a little cheesy. Well, radio voices are cheesy. I <laughs> Have I got the perfect product for you? For only eight easy installments of your total life savings, you too can have perfect teeth. I'm totally running this into the ground. Um, save us, please. <laughs> uh, we may be beyond help at this point. Mm. Only Jesus. So I think it's interesting as I was reading this that the sinners that Jesus chooses to point out are tax collectors and prostitutes. Um, I'm curious as to why those are the two things that he points out. My guess would be that the people he's talking to have as little to do with those types of people as possible. Because, well, obviously, you know, any good upstanding Pharisee or scribe or teacher or rabbi would have nothing to do with a prostitute because Mm -hmm. unclean. Right. Um, And tax collectors were seen as... Um, just awful, terrible, rotten people because they would collect taxes and then fleece people for extra so they could become rich. So you've got, um, you know, folks who are bending the law to their will to get rich off of other people illegally, and then you have people that are uh, morally and physically unclean because of the sexual um, activity that they 
uh, take part in for business. Um, I would imagine that nowadays we would probably keep prostitutes in there, but we would replace tax collectors with, um, I don't know, uh, Ponzi scheme type, <laughs> you know, yes. um, I'm trying to think of what's the, uh, the word for like, um, the, the, the fake stock brokers that prey on old people and like steal all their money on fake investments like yeah. those types, yeah. just real unsavory, greedy idiots. Well, not idiots. They're obviously very intelligent. They just have no ethical or moral code. Yeah. So that's my my thought. Well, and that's I, and I, I even think they're sort of, and I don't, I don't know, but kind of in line with what you were saying of, I get the sense that a prostitute probably doesn't feel great about her standing in society. Uh, I think it's typical of even what happens today of. I don't have other options, uh, so this is what I do, and I do it because it's um, available. Um, you know, uh, I'm not going to say it's easy because I don't think it's easy, but it's, you know, there's kind of a, if you're a woman, you can do it, kind of a, you know, for that matter, if you're a guy, you can do it. There's certainly male and female prostitutes. So there's just sort of this sense of when I think of a prostitute, I think of, of destitute. It's not your first option of what you want to be doing. Um, then when I think of a tax collector, uh, I think of more of a corrupt person, but maybe a little more clueless about like there's there's sort of this I choose to do this because I can and I want to and um I don't know maybe I'm trying to make more out of this than I can but it just seems like there's there's two very different ends of the spectrum for these sorts of people in terms of uh their financial situation and uh while tax collectors are not necessarily probably liked by a lot of people they probably live very well and before maybe being convicted of their sin, probably are happy to be doing what they're doing. <laughs> so I don't know. It just seems like those are two very ex two extremes of sort of sin uh, to to talk about um, people who choose to uh, follow Jesus and what John said and repent and that sort of thing. So interesting. So essentially, he's comparing the tax collectors and the prostitutes to the first son mm -hmm. who have not lived, you know, as God told them to, but after hearing John have changed their ways and mm -hmm. have decided to, um, to try uh, to, to live a godly life and, and to follow God, right? They, they've understood what John was saying, and Jesus shows up, and all is good. Whereas you've got the the tax, or sorry, no, the uh, scribes and the Pharisees and, and the teachers and the rabbis and that whole crew that says to God, yes, we'll go teach your law, and we'll go, you know, um, run the temple, and we'll do all the things that Scripture calls us to do. But even when they see John and they see Jesus, they're so wrapped up in um, what they're doing that they're unwilling to uh, see the truth that's in front of them. Yeah. And so, I mean, I, I think it's it's it, we would be remiss if we didn't say that. I genuinely think that the Pharisees and the Sadducees and the scribes and all of them thought they were right. Yeah. I don't think they would have acted the way they did if they didn't think that they were right and Jesus was just some Yahoo. Absolutely, yeah. Um, and I think that's what's so sad about it, is that they were so convinced 
that they were right and he was wrong, that they were unwilling to even consider the fact that the opposite may be true. Mm -hmm. And I think perhaps that might be what Jesus is trying to get at here is like, like even these people that have lived lives of sin, whether it be debauchery or luxury or thievery or sexual immorality or what have you, they saw the truth and they were willing to trade in what they knew to be true for what really is true. Mm -hmm. And it's totally different from what they were doing. In the same way, what I offer is totally different than what you are doing. But you are unwilling to take what you believe to be true and swap it for what really is true. And um, it's just sad. Yeah, absolutely. When you see people who are so convinced that they are right that they're unwilling to even consider something else being not even true but possible. You know? So. Yeah. Um, and I, it's, it's interesting cause I was just, and I can't remember where I saw this at or where I came across it, but, um, and it was, it was a Christian author or devotional or something of basically I- encouraging the reader to say to God, show me what I'm missing. Like what, what is it that I think I've got right? that I don't have right and reveal that to me. And, uh, it's not an easy thing to do. Not something I want to do, (laughs) (laughs) but it was very, it was very convicting of, I'm sure there's things that I think I've got right that I probably, that I clearly don't have right. And, um, you know, I have to own that as myself, but just really had a sense of, Boy, if we all did that and did it genuinely of God, show us what we think we've got right that we don't, um, what could that do uh, for the body of Christ if people were willing? And I'm not talking about just, you know, changing your way of thinking just to be cool or to be hip or to be trendy or whatever, but to truly just go, maybe this is different than the way I see it. And. God convict me of that. And it's like you said, I, I don't even think it, it necessarily needs to be that I completely have to abandon what I believe, but it's just like, Hmm, that person of there may not have it as wrong as I think they do. Uh, it, it may not be an essential like I think it is. Yeah. I think the, the ability for a person to initially um, consider themselves wrong is a unique trait. I know I've mentioned it before, um, but like my default mode is I'm right. Mm -hmm. Even if it's something that I'm not educated in. I just have enough faith in my ability to guess or surmise, you know, which is ridiculous when you think about it. Mm -hmm. Um, And when it's about things that I know or things that I have um, experience in, then even more so my initial reaction is, well, of course I'm right. Um, Now, uh, as I have, you know, uh, started growing up, and you know, gotten a little bit older, and and uh, spent more time in you know the adult world, as they say. I have begun to uh, realize that while that may be my initial reaction, it certainly has become less and less my secondary reaction, and where I can kind of feel myself going, "Whoa, man, don't you question?" You know, and I'm much more willing now. And I think this is a direct result of being married for seven years um, to a woman who's always right. <laughs> uh, I, I am, I am starting and uh, more, um, more uh, regularly going. Okay, maybe I'm not right here. Maybe I am missing something. 
maybe this is an opportunity to learn. Maybe this is an opportunity to where even if I am right, an opportunity to teach. Mm-hmm. Uh, or in the opportunity that I'm wrong to say, you know what? I was wrong. And thank you for showing me uh, how I was wrong. And um, that is a much, for me, a much more peaceful place to be. I mean, I don't like being wrong, but I'm not, a, I'm not, I'm not nearly as afraid of it as I was when I was, you know, a hotshot high schooler trying to prove how smart he was to everybody. Cause I was super insecure. Mm-hmm. Um, so yeah, so I, I just, I think whenever I meet someone who is humble enough that, you know, that they know that they don't know everything. You, I feel like I can pick those people out because they they seem to me to be so infrequent that when I hear someone like a Dallas Willard talk, yeah, I'm like, okay, you sir are very different, and I want to know how you got this way because I find that um, personality and character uh, to be very attractive mm-hmm. and very life giving and very. Um, uh, encouraging of others to become that way. I think that's why I like him so much. Mm-hmm. Yeah. The I, the other thing is too is as just being uh a parent and and asking my kids to do things, telling my kids to do things. Um I'm just thinking about a lot of the different answers that you get because um, there are times where I think they genuinely think they're going to go do it and then just never do what you ask them to do. And then there's times where I think they just give you the answer and just go, I know if I tell them this, they'll quit bugging me about it. And, and maybe they, you know, they won't ever answer. So I even think there's, there's an element of, Sometimes it's intentional and I'm choosing to disobey and, you know, and this is, this is the child that answers, yes, dad, I'll do it. I think there's the intentional, I'm I'm just going to not do it and give them lip service. And then I think there's the unintentional times of, they have every intention of doing it, but then when it comes around to doing it, they don't do it. And so, um, I don't know. It just, again, it's that snapshot of just human nature and that, um, I don't know. I, I, is my, is my disobedience of God as intentional as what I think it is? Is it part of my sinful, uh, fallen nature? Um, and I, you know, the answer is probably yes. Sometimes it's a little bit of both, just like it is, um, with my children. Um, and actually I was having a point to what you were saying of just, you know, you talk about, you see those people that stand out to you. And I do, I think it's such a rare person that does say yes, Lord. And then there's consistency in how they, it gets carried out with them. And then you got just about everybody else like me that, <laughs> Sometimes I'm well intentioned, and then sometimes I'm just outright disobedient. I'm I'm giving lip service because I know what I'm really going to do. So, all right. So, I I, I find their response of oh the first or his question which of the two uh, did the will of his father. My initial response is neither of them. Because the first one said no. I mean, yeah, then, then they went and did it, but like no one was obedient. No one said yes, and then went and actually did it. I, just, right. I find that part of this very interesting because their response is, well, the first one. And again, my response was no, neither of them. Mm-hmm. And one of them said, no, I will not. But yet they're the good example because... They saw the error of their ways, I suppose, and then decided to do what the father told them to do after their little moment of defiance. And, and I suppose that shows a the process of uh, realizing that 
you're in the wrong, repenting of that decision, and then going and doing what you're asking for. And in that sense, you know, while they may not have, in my uh, definition, done his will, they understood the error of their ways and then changed to do it, which is what God calls us to do, is to repent and to go, you know, live a life worthy of, you know, the salvation that we have. Um, I just find that that response interesting because that's not at all what I thought. Yeah, and I I guess there's even an element of, um, you know, in terms of, like, you're talking about being obedient and all those kinds of things. If, I think this is what I'm thinking. It's my, you know, if I'm honest, my, my, even in my obedience and saying, yes, God, there's still my, my true response is no, God, I don't really want to do this. And so is there something, um, I, I don't know. Is there, is there something about being honest about God? I don't really want to do this. And then doing, is there something, I can't think of the word that I'm looking for there. Is there value in that? Is there, um, an intrinsic sort of, um, is that how we truly acknowledge God and we're truly, truly obedient to God is on the front end going, my natural sinful response to you is no God. And I will do my best to be obedient. Is that a more realistic sort of answer in the um, comparison of who we are to God and what obedience really is? Yeah. And are we just pretending when we say, yes, God will do it and we do it versus kind of this, no, God, I acknowledge my natural uh, tendency is to, to, to go against you. And if I'm being truly honest, I'll say that on the front end even if I do end up doing ultimately what it is I should do. Kind of reminds me of Jonah. Mm-hmm. Oh, God yeah. God telling him to go do something. And not only does he say no, he runs in the opposite direction. And only when confronted with a truly ridiculous situation of being stuck inside of a giant fish, does he say, okay, fine. <laughs> you know, and then even after he goes to Nineveh and, and preaches and, and they all repent, he then gets, you know, mad at the little shade leaf. And so, I mean, sure. he definitely disobeyed, but the will of God was still accomplished mm -hmm. through him. So maybe I should give the first uh, son a bit more credit because that's really, I mean, in this story, that's the boat we want to be in is, is we want to be the first son as opposed to the second. Mm-hmm. I always feel like there should be a third option, though, Dave. <laughs> Jesus always finds the third option. Yeah, and that's... Uh, I mean, how many other options are there even in this? You know, when you think about a request being made of somebody and our response to someone... Well, I, I see only two other options. You say yes and you actually do it. You say no. Or you say no and you don't do it. Mm-hmm. I feel like that covers your possibilities. Yeah. And I feel like at least the people that say no and don't do it are honest. You know? Mm -hmm. And so are the people that say yes and do it. Um, it's just these two situations where the, the initial response and then the follow-up are opposite that cause you know the the moral and ethical dilemmas of honesty and repentance and you know in this case i'm assuming forgiveness being shown the first son and judgment being shown the second mm -hmm. so this is another interesting thing that I see. He says, Truly I say to you, the tax collectors and the prostitutes go into the kingdom of God before you. Which assumes... They're going to go. They're going to go. Even though they did not do what they said they were going to do. Which is curious. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I, would, I would have to say that 
And this is one of the things that, as we've we've been doing the podcast and talking about the the Pharisees and the scribes and the priests and all that sort of thing is, uh, and and I think this comes from what I've seen in movies, um, maybe a little bit from my interpretation of scripture is that they're adversarial to him. They're always trying to catch him. They're always trying to to prove him wrong. But I, but I have this have had this sense, especially over the last few chapters, of just that they're enamored by him. They're drawn to him. There's this sense of this guy knows what he is talking about, and uh, they can't help but showing up and engaging him where he is. And um, you know, I think we touched on this at the, even at the beginning of the podcast that. There is, I believe, a desire to do right, maybe a stronger desire to be right than to do right. Um, that, you know, um, you take Paul, for example, of, um, you know, pros- I can't say the word, prosecuting. Persecuting. Right? Persecuting. Why was I saying that? the persecuting? Thank you. Persecuting the the Christians, uh, you know, and then God having this moment of, you know, revealing himself to him and his conversion. And um, so at the very least, Paul was probably in that category of, are the, the prostitutes and the tax collectors going to get there before Paul? <laughs> Is he in that category of... You uh, you did all these things, and now you're there. So, um, and and as and I can't pull any specific scripture out at the moment, but I, as I think about Paul's letters from beginning to end, I I think there's an acknowledgement on that level of, on his part of uh, you know I'm I'm the biggest center of them all. Mm-hmm. Um. So, yeah, I'm guessing there were some Pharisees and scribes and those folks who were converted and are in the kingdom, and um, it was probably a little bit tougher for them than it was <laughs> the prostitutes and the tax collectors. All right. Anything else on this passage, Dave? Um, I don't know that I have anything, uh, specific, but, um, the thing that I, I guess I'm asking myself as I look at this is, um, in what, in what areas of my life have I had my sin revealed and I'm, I'm, and it maybe even goes back to the discussion earlier of God revealed to me where I'm wrong. But but I have a very sense that that uh, I'm I'm both of these sides. There are places in my life where I'm the the tax collector or the prostitute, and I'm aware of that sin, and I'm just like God, forgive me, change me, heal me. And then I just still think I have these areas in my life where I think I have it all together and I've got it right, and I don't think I need to change. And uh, I think there's there's just an element of this of of being somebody that gives complete surrender to God in every aspect of we are, and we really need to let go of those places where we think we're right. Um, because I think we hide behind, um, I think I'm, we hide behind, I'm declaring God's truth. This is what God said, and I'm upholding the truth, and I'm upholding the Bible, and and those sort of things. And it's like, no, I still think it's about me being right versus really honoring God and mm-hmm. just need to let go of those things. So, yeah, that would, I guess, sort of be my last just um, putting thought into words and what uh, personally I'm I'm wrestling with um, as I meditate and look at the Scripture. Cool. I appreciate you sharing that. Well, I think that brings us to... The end of episode 74, I hate my radio voice. Why do I go into that? That's, uh, here's the deal. 
ladies and gentlemen, episode 74 is over. We're glad that you listened. We really are. And if you want to get in touch, you can do so in uh, some very easy ways. Twitter is great for uh, just quick interaction. We'd love to get to know you guys, meet new people. Uh, Dave's 10-8-H-B-O, T-E-N, the number 8, H-B-O. Mm-hmm. I'm at Cam Brennan, C-A-M-B-R-E-N-N-A-N. And you can email us at hello at supermegacorp.net. And then if you want to see the show notes, supermegacorp.net slash masterclass slash 74. Be sure to go to the website, check out some of our other stuff. We'd love to know. Uh, I don't know what you think. Sounds good. Yeah. You ever go to the website, Dave? Uh, on occasion, yes, I do. Mm. <laughs> you can see Dave's pretty face, too, if you go to the contact page. <laughs> All right, we'll see you next time. Bye.